All right, here we are, my friends, and we're back, and we've got a lot of business to attend to. Of course, let's go to our mind map to see what's on the docket for the day. Here, we've got our three big segment segments that we're going to spend some time unpacking. We've got, of course, Ted Cruz versus Director Christopher Way. Ray, he was at the FBI. He's part of the FBI. He was at the Judiciary Committee hearing in the Senate today, and we're going to unpack his testimony because... We have a lot of questions about the FBI. You know, the FBI has had a lot of problems, I think, over the last couple months. We've covered a lot of them. But, you know, they, they're out there, you know, scrapping around trying to find people who have Lego sets of the Capitol building like domestic terrorists. But they got an opportunity now in the Senate to ask them questions. And so you see here Ted Cruz, Lion Ted or Lion Ted, whatever you want to call him. He was here and look behind him. He's got the documents that leaked from Project Veritas that detail how militias organize themselves and what symbols they use. And it gives the FBI sort of a like a paint by numbers, like identify, you know, sort of, you know, how do you identify different plants like what's poison ivy or what's you know poison oak well you look at the leaves and so they have the same thing here they're saying look at militant terrorists in america look at their symbols <gasps> and so the fbi is really playing that game now and well, ted cruz is not having it so he went after christopher ray on it we will spend some time talking about the project veritas leak because they actually leaked this whole thing and christopher ray of course is going to give responses and answers on this thing that you would expect, right? That you would sort of expect from him. And so we will get into that. We've got here Christopher Ray actually talking about promoting somebody who was involved in the Whitmer plot. Marsha Blackburn asked him about Russian disinformation and, of course, Hunter Biden. And he doesn't know much about that. And then Christopher Ray, he got out of there early. He had the jet on out of there. So, like, literally, he's like, um, are we done here, senators? I got some place to be. And they said, oh, sir, yeah, yeah, certainly. Why don't you just uh, scooty, scoot your little caboose on out of here there, Christopher. Wherever you need to go, it's certainly more important than this hearing. So have a nice trip. Bon voyage. And Christopher Ray got out of there. So we'll spend some time at the start of the show unpacking all of that. And now we're going to jump in to some criminal law, serious criminal law. Actually, a little bit of criminal law. We're going to sort of transition before we get into some uh, some new criminal-ish law. A lot of this stuff is overlapping, so you'll see what I mean here. Peter Navarro, new suit, right? A new claim filed against him that is a civil claim, and they really, really want to get their hands on his Proton Mail account. Okay, so when you're part of government, you're supposed to have your emails go through one centralized server location. This kind of has remnants of the Hillary Clinton saga, and you know she sort of. Uh, kind of screwed up her emails a little bit, might've cost her the presidency. And she was, you know, ble uh, wiping them with a cloth. Like, did you wipe your emails? And she's like, what do you mean? Like with a cloth? I'm Hillary, right? And everybody in the media is like, well, that's a funny, that's, she's, she's really clever and how fun is that? But Peter Navarro now, they want his emails and I'm not so sure that he's gonna have the ability to go out there and wipe his Proton Mail account or anything like that. So we will go through that. We also are gonna take a look at a criminal motion to compel. He filed a motion to compel in the criminal case saying that the government is not giving him any discovery, no disclosure. And so we'll take a look at that motion as well. So we've got a little bit of civil law in his case and a little bit of criminal law that we will attend to. And then we've got Brianna Taylor. And my goodness, we're circling back hard on this one. I mean, for those of you who've been around for quite some time, this is one of the first cases that we ever covered on this channel. I mean, I started this really kind of getting serious about, you know, sort of covering the topical stuff in 2020 when COVID hit, because like everybody else, I thought, well, there goes all my public speaking. There goes all of my, you know, sort of uh, in-person networking events. And so we jumped into YouTube and sort of made that a full-time thing here, but we covered Brianna Taylor in depth and lo and behold, we fast forward two years. Turns out some of these officers are even worse than we had suspected. So we've got a little bit of a bad popo segment here and Attorney General Merrick Garland is now prosecuting them. If we'll take a look at what the Civil Rights Division came out with. We've got indictments afoot. And, you know, there's some mixed sort of opinions on some of this stuff. And so I want to see what you have to say about it. But, of course, we've got these four officers who all got criminally charged in federal courts. We've got Kyle Meany. He's a, a current sergeant. We've got Joshua Jaynes, Brett Hankinson, and Kelly Goodlett. And there's some hinting here. There's some indications that these individuals were falsifying the warrant before they went into Breonna Taylor's house. And then after the tragedy, what happened? Well, they covered it up, as you can expect. 
So we'll go into that story and spend some time taking a look at the actual indictments. There's an information as well, which we don't talk a lot about because they don't, we don't see them as much, but Kelly Goodlett is a new face. We haven't heard from her yet in this case. We've talked a lot about Hankinson. Remember old Hanky, Brett Hanky? Yeah, we talked a lot about him, but he is, of course, now facing even uh, additional charges from the Biden DOJ re related to Breonna Taylor. And so we will get into all of that and more. But my goodness, my friends, I just see that we had another gift of memberships from Paul Mino. Paul Mino is in the house and he gifted five memberships. That's, a, that's outstanding. Thank you very much for doing that, Paul. And so we're going to have a lot of, uh, of additional people. Yeah. Lean saying thank you. Thank you for the gifting. Super cool. Okay. So I think Paul, I think Paul is probably experiencing the same thing that I experienced. It just sort of divvies them out, I think. Right. And uh, you don't get to do anything with them, but still super cool. And so we've got a couple of those. Now, I also saw, before we jump into it, a super chat came in from Ronnie Cole. And Ronnie Cole was asking, shout out to Ronnie Cole. I appreciate that, Ronnie. Ronnie Cole was asking, even though this sort of flew by my screen, Ronnie Cole was asking if Stacey Abrams had delivered the ballots here to Arizona. And uh, no, I don't think so. I think she's still probably printing them or you know, writing, you know, filling in the bubbles or something. I'm not sure what's going on there. So she's probably getting wrapped up, you know, finishing up those and then they're going to throw them in the back of a U-Haul and they're going to ship them over from Georgia and then deliver them to, uh, uh, I guess, Katie Hobbs, <laughs> who's going to then decide who the next uh, victor is in Arizona. And so thank you for that, Ronnie Cole. Yeah. So yeah, she's, she's still working hard. You know, she's not done yet. You know, she needs a little bit more time. She needs some additional time. So uh, thank you, Ronnie Cole. And it's a supply chain problem, says Curtis Bartle. Yeah, they're working on it. All right. So <laughs> you can see my friends, we've got a lot to get to. And if you want to be a part of the show, I'd invite you to join us over at watching the watchers.locals.com or join us by clicking that join button. You can see basically the whole chat's members today because, <laughs> because we, we sort of uh, gifted a bunch of those, but there is a, a couple places, a couple ways you can join us over over on Locals, they're chatting away. B Spec is in the house, Jumpin' Jeff, Gregory's here, and I see, who else is here? Jumpin' Jeff, see the veil, I'm, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, and Karaoke Princess, and I saw Radice is also here, shout out to Radice, and uh, see the veil and others. And so we share stories throughout the day, and I post daily walk and talks, which is sort of carrying on the conversation before and after the show, and that's a good way to support the work that we're doing. Another good way to support our work here, Refer to our law firm, the r, r Law Group. If you happen to know anybody who's in a difficult situation facing criminal charges, r, r Law Group in Scottsdale, Arizona. We help people from all over the world. People come to Arizona. Good people get charged with crimes. We have a mission to help them find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and beyond that in their lives. Free case evaluations, 480-787-0394. And your referrals keep us busy and help us really deliver our life's work, right? Deliver our passion. And so we're, we're, we're grateful for that. And now my friends, without any further ado, let's get right into it, shall we? Ted Cruz versus Christopher Ray, the showdown in the Senate Judiciary hearing. There was a lot of back and forth and it all relates back to the FBI and their nefariousness. We are gonna start with Ted Cruz today. We've got several clips with, from Ted, from Marsha Blackburn, and then Christopher Ray really had to get out of there. Something kind of strange happened. He said, uh, are we done here? I have to go now. My flight is about to take off. And the senators are just like, yeah, sir, whatever you need. Yeah, see ya. So we'll take a look at that. But first and foremost, before we dive in, we've got to get a little bit of background, a little bit of foundation set from Project Veritas. Now they posted last night something very interesting. And I think I have the link here, it tells us an FBI whistleblower leaks the Bureau's domestic terrorism symbols guide. All right, now we've talked a lot about this. Okay, there's all sorts of different uh, DVEs, domestic violent extremism. Remember we heard about RMVEs, which was racially uh, motivated violent extremism, RMVEs. Then we had uh, homegrown domestic violent extremism. So HGDVE, it's like, what the heck is going on? How many different permutations of letters can you have in one society? I mean, we already sort of used all the letters for another issue, and now we've got all of these other letters for this whole new issue, and we're running out of space. There's not enough letters in the alphabet for all of these things, but they've got a new one now. This one is now hitting the books. It is called Militia Violent Extremists. You can see that here, MVEs, and they're citing Ashley Babbitt as an MVE martyr. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Yeah, she's a martyr. She died for the cause. A leaked document 
is labeled as such. We're going to take a close look at this, but Project Veritas released this uh, on the 2nd. They show how the Bureau classifies these people. I, you can see it's a very blurry document. It looks like somebody took a photograph of it on a table, and they sort of... Uh, Sort of looks like they added this layer and sort of you know gave it a shadow and all of that but it looks like somebody just took sort of a sort of a blurry photo with a phone but we will take a look at it but i wanted to see yeah there's not there's no real information about where this came from but as you'll see here is the actual document in full and i snipped through and i have some highlights here it's probably difficult to see because it's quite blurry, but you can see the Gadsden flag, right? It's there. It says commonly referenced historical imagery or quotes. It's got the Liberty tree flag. The Liberty tree was a famous, uh, a famous elm tree is what it says in Boston, near Boston common in 1765 colonists in Boston says the first act of defiance against the British government at the tree at the Liberty tree. Betsy Ross flag. Okay. Also on there as a symbol saying this is war imagery, hearkening back to the 13 colonies, and also just sort of a general concept of revolutionary war imagery. Right here, you can see, you know, example of militiamen during the Revolutionary War. These are revolutionaries. These are people who say that the federal government is garbage and useless. And apparently, according to the FBI, that is, uh, well, let's see what they say here. So here's another screenshot of this. Symbols. Now, We've seen a lot of the Punisher symbols. We've talked some about that even in the Uvalde case. But here, uh, right, there were officers with the Punisher symbol on his on his background. So apparently that guy was uh, a militia terrorist or extremist or something. I don't know. But here you see another flag, a boogaloo. We've got Punisher skull. Anything talking about the 2A militant violent extremists justify their existence with the Second Amendment due to the due to the mentor. Uh, whatever message about well-regulated militias. Okay. Also see this warrior culture and anarcho capitalism, right? The ANCAPs, an ideology held saying that some MVEs are advocating the state be eliminated and minimized. <gasps> You're kidding me. People saying the federal government is basically useless is okay. Well, I'm in big trouble over here. Militia violent extremism. Here's their summary. The following symbols that we just talked about are used by anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremists, specifically MVEs. MVE symbols are often found on propaganda, online platforms, memes, merchandise, group logos, flags, tattoos, uniforms, etc. Widespread use of symbols and quotes from American history, especially the Revolutionary War, exist within MVE networks. Historic and contemporary military themes are common for MVE symbols. The use or sharing of these symbols alone should not be independently evidence of MVE presence or affiliation or serve as an indicator of illegal activities. As many individuals use these things for other nonviolent purposes. Isn't that nice? So they identify all of the terrorists and they say, but some of these people aren't terrorist. And so just because they have a symbol doesn't mean you should castigate them as such. And we've talked a lot about this here on the show. This is the government sort of covering their butts, right? They can't, like, for example, we talk about this in the context of DUIs all the time. If they make a basis for a traffic stop, like a DUI, for example, a one variable indicator, well, then everybody's going to fight that one variable, that one indicator, that one sort of bit of indicia. So when they spread it out over a bunch of different things, okay, what's going to draw your attention to somebody? Is it going to be their logo? Probably. And if you, if you, if you, if you take a look at their logo, because it's been identified for you from the FBI, then that's going to draw your attention to it, right? Then you're going to be sort of looking, it's confirmation bias at that point. Now, oh, I, I can look at a three percenter or a Gaston flag person and we'll take a look and we'll say, that is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Now I can go find what I actually need, right? So here, there's more to this from Project Veritas, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. Go over to their website and follow along. But this is what is the basis of Ted Cruz's first line of questioning. So here he is. Senate Judiciary hearing today, and it's Ted Cruz versus Christopher Ray. Remember, Christopher Ray is the director of the FBI. We've talked a lot about him. And he received a letter from Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson and many other senators, and they've been very upset with the FBI for their handling of basically everything. And we're going to get into this a little bit more, but here is Ted Cruz. It's four minutes. We'll start and stop this and just sort of parse through it bit by bit. Director Ray, I'm deeply concerned that the FBI and the Department of Justice have become 
thoroughly politicized. Yeah. I think this is a problem that began during the Obama administration. I think it metastasized with career officials during the Trump administration, and I think it continues and is even worse today under the Biden administration. I don't believe you personally reflect that politicization, but I think you've been unwilling to root it out and unwilling to hold people accountable for the politicization. I hear regularly from FBI agents and from professionals at the Department of Justice who are dismayed that our law enforcement has been weaponized and politicized rather than remaining apolitical as it has been for the history of our country. Yesterday, it was reported that Project Veritas had obtained a copy of an FBI training material. There it is. Which listed various symbols and themes which, in the FBI's estimation, were indicative of, quote, militia violent extremism. Now, these symbols weren't things like the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi Party, which naturally would be symbols of that. But instead, they included, rather astonishingly, patriotic symbols of our nation and our history. Included on this list is the Betsy Ross flag. Now, that's fairly remarkable that the Betsy Ross flag in the FBI's indication is indicative of violent, uh, militia violent extremism, because among other people who have been publicly alongside the Betsy Ross flag, we have President Barack Obama, who was sworn in directly underneath two Betsy Ross flags. Mm. But it's not just President Obama. Mm. We also have President Biden, who was sworn in under Betsy Ross flag. Oh, interesting. Now, I got to say, Ted Cruz is very good at this, right? He's one of the better senators or better politicians really ever who does these types of performances. Now, this is two minutes into this, okay? He's got a limited amount of time, two minutes into it. There's not even a single question. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to, you know, this is, this is what politicians do. Ted Cruz is sort of, I think, a cut above the others. Nobody else really comes in with a lot of... Um, theatrics as much as Ted Cruz does, right? He brings in the podiums, he brings in the whiteboards and all of the printed poster boards and all of the graphics and a lot of sort of stuff is involved in it. And you're going to see he's got another little shtick coming here in a minute, but still not really a question, right? He hasn't asked a question yet. And he hasn't even confirmed for us, to my knowledge, that this is an official FBI document at all, right? Or that this was something that Christopher Ray can even talk about. But he's sort of delivering this for Twitter. He's delivering this for YouTube because he knows people like me are going to say, oh, well done there, Ted. And uh, that's exactly what he's doing. But we're not going to get much substantive out of this because it is Christopher Ray, of course. It's not just the Betsy Ross flag. Also on this list is the Gadsden flag as a symbol of violent extremism. Now, the state of Virginia has a license plate <laughs> for the Gadsden pl flag, as do many other states. Props. He's got props. I think people would be astonished to find that having that license plate, the FBI indicates that you're a violent extremist. Also included on this is a text that I was particularly struck. Now watch this. Is the Gonzalez battle flag. Watch. Come and take it. As indicative of being a violent extremist militia. Well, I will self-report right now. Here it is. That every day in the Senate, I wear my boots that have the Gonzalez battle flag on the back of them. There it is. <laughs> Director Ray, what are y'all doing? Ugh. Perfect. It's perfect. Home this run. This makes no sense. <laughs> do, you, do you agree with this FBI guidance that the Betsy Ross flag and the Gadsden flag and the Gonzalez battle flag are signs of militia violent extremism? Here we go. Well, Senator, I, I'm not familiar with the particular document you have behind you. No idea. Uh, and I'm not in the practice of trying to comment on documents that I haven't uh, recognized, but Never I will tell you that when we put out intelligence products, <laughs> including ones that reference... Never seen the document, okay? Doesn't even know what the heck he's talking about. But meanwhile, we can see that basically he came with, I think, six props. I mean, we have, we have what, what was this? Let's see, we got three poster boards right there, three poster boards, two easels, and we have a boot, and we've got the Virginia flag, the gas and flag. So Ted Cruz comes prepared. And uh, Christopher Ray, unfortunately, this would have been really, really useful if Christopher Ray had seen the document or uh, or was honest about <laughs> this. But he goes, nope, no idea what you're even talking about. Very strange, and I can't comment on it. 
uh, recognized. But I will tell you that when we put out intelligence products, including ones that reference symbols, which we do across a wide variety of contexts, we usually uh, make great pains, take great pains to put uh, caveats and warnings in the document that make clear that a symbol alone is not considered evidence of violent extremism, uh, and it's well. But Director Ray, you don't include on. things like Antifa. You don't include yeah. things like Black Lives Matter. Instead, you identify patriotic Americans as suspect. And I would note there's a pattern of this. He's exactly right. So Ted Cruz goes off and he details exactly what we've been covering here, right? All of the different letters that we started this segment with, the DVEs, the HGVEs, the RMVEs, the now the MVEs, it's like, good Lord, man. And every time you turn around, there's a new contingent of Americans that is the enemy, right? That are the enemy. And something very interesting, right, that we've covered here was the Whitmer kidnapping plot, okay? Something the FBI was supposedly investigating. They had a bunch of individuals who were protecting Governor Whitmer and they got this, the FBI agents uncovered this plot to kidnap her right in the months leading up to an election out there in Michigan. And we covered this, all the FBI agents were a bunch of just total garbage losers. Some of them were charged with domestic violence after, you know, wild, uh, you know, parties, you know, where they were engaged. This is a family show, but they were engaging in swinger parties all over the place. And, oh, hey, shout out. It's Marvin. Marvin's in the house. Look at the Marvin. He's right there. So, so all of these people are sort of, you know, in, engaged in nefariousness and they are walking around like they are America's saviors. They're people who are protecting all of us. And during that Whitmer plot, right, actually that went to trial and several people were totally acquitted because many of the FBI agents were as bad as I just sort of described and some, some even worse. And you start looking at this thing and most of the people in the plot seem to be like they were undercover informants or actual FBI agents who were sort of creating a, a, a an entire fake narrative in order to indict some people to pad their numbers so that they could report back to guys like Christopher Ray oh, we've got some no, new MVEs that we rounded up. We've got some new HGVEs. Sounds like a cable channel. And this guy, right, is now going to say that he promoted the person who was responsible for that giant catastrophe. And I know many of you spent some time with us covering it. Here's Ted Cruz asking him, hey, what happened to the person over at the Chicago field office who was responsible for that or wherever the field office was? Recently, there was the case against individuals charged with kidnapping and murdering Governor Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. That case ended up an absolute debacle where the four people who went to trial, two of them were acquitted, two received mistrials. None of them were convicted on even a single charge. And the basis of the defense was entrapment. Yeah. That the FBI, that paid enforcements for the FBI, had suggested and had incited the conduct. Let me ask you, how many FBI agents were disciplined or reprimanded after that disastrous case <clears throat> and the misconduct that led to every defendant being acquitted or having a mistrial on every charge. That your law enforcement agents uh, Senator, I can't comment on a personnel matter. I can tell you that that case, as I understand it, is now pending a, uh, a retrial, as I understand it. Yeah. Well, the special agent in charge of that case has now been sent. It is pending a retrial, and I added that to my docket list, and it is very likely going to you know go forward but what ted cruz says was accurate right there were there were many acquittals and many hung verdicts that came out of this thing and he's not going to comment on personnel issues so remember remember why these people come in front of congress congress is the body that governs the finances of the federal government and so they've got sort of a responsibility to make sure that the money is being appropriated appro appropriately so that it's not going down the toilet, so that we don't have political institutions that bubble up and then start to undermine American values and law enforcement efforts across the board. Ted Cruz is asking him about this. Your agents, whom we know were engaged in serious wrongdoing, have they been disciplined? Can't answer that, okay. And so now it continues. To DC, to the Washington DC office, and now leads the investigation regarding January 6th. Is that correct? Let me back that up. Charge of that case. The person in charge of the Whitmer plot, what happened to him? Uh, Senator, I can't comment on a personnel matter. I can tell you that that case, as I understand it, is now pending a, uh, a retrial, as I understand it. Well, the special agent in charge of that case has now been sent 
to D.C., to the Washington, D.C. office, and now leads the investigation regarding January 6th. Is that correct? That doesn't sound right to me. That does not sound right. The, the, the name of the individual is Stephen D'Antuno. He was, he was run out of the FBI Detroit field office. Okay. And by the way, I will point okay. out that the lead investigator, Special Agent Track, are you aware that he was apparently Him. fired <laughs> for allegedly beating his wife after coming home from a swingers party? Yeah. And he made multiple derogatory political posts about President Trump showing... That guy. I didn't know Ted Cruz was going to get into him, but yeah, that's that's the one I was talking about. Political bias. Are you aware of that? I am aware of, I think, the incident you're describing uh, and action that was taken about it. Uh, to clarify on the first part of your question, uh, Mr. D'Antuano was the special agent in charge of the office, uh, the Detroit field office, and is now the assistant director in charge of the Washington field office. I thought uh... you were asking about the agent who was responsible for the So the guy in charge got promoted and is now in charge of the January 6th investigation. The guy in charge of the whole Detroit field office is now in charge of the whole Washington field office. That is astonishing. It is astonishing, Ted. It is astonishing, isn't it? And so you can see what happens, right? Uh, hey, why don't you go over here and just run an office that's responsible for concocting a fake hoax that led to the Whitmer plot prosecution with a bunch of innocent people who were, you know, sort of hanging around, talking with undercover agents who got entrapped into being a part of this plot all acquitted or mistrialed and now they're going to try it again because they you know because the government keeps going right they have the ability to do that but ted cruz is saying you are unbelievable for promoting that guy right he was somebody who botched that whole story created a narrative for you why don't you send him over to dc he'll do he'll do the whole thing again one narrative in michigan another one in dc not a big surprise so that is Christopher Ray. Now, of course, there are other topics, and it's not only a Ted Cruz segment today. We've got one clip from Marsha Blackburn, and because it's this clip that really summarizes the rest of the hearing. We've got a lot of questions for Christopher Ray. I, you know, have bullet points in our J6 mind map at j6mindmap.com, where we want serious answers for all the little minutia that has popped up throughout our coverage of the January 6 saga but we don't get any answers from him. Why? Because this is how he responds when he gets substantive questions. Here's Senator Blackburn, who is asking him two questions, one about Russian disinformation, the other about Hunter Biden. That's right. They're trying to do Americans uh, looked at what they perceived to be, and I think rightly so, a ton of money that was wasted on the Russia collusion investigation so do you agree that the allegation of secret collusion between president trump and russia was a hoax yes or no i i, I don't think that's the terminology i would use but uh i think there's been a lot written on this subject and uh, both in the special counsel's report the inspector general's it's report yes or no, it's fine. so that's not a term i would use so no okay, okay. Uh, do so you not... agree that the hunter biden laptop was not Russia disinformation. Uh, now you're asking about an ongoing investigation uh, that I expect our folks to okay. pursue aggressively, and I just I can't comment on okay. that. Okay, and you comment. possess the laptop, right? Uh, again, I can't discuss that can't. ongoing okay. Okay. investigation. Don't you just love it? No, we can't comment about any of this stuff. Ongoing investigation, and we don't want to jeopardize anything. So it's very, very interesting, you know. If you don't open an investigation, then you say you're getting special privilege. If you do open an investigation or, or you say there's nothing there and that person is getting special privilege. But if you open the investigation, then that person is you know sort of under investigation, but you can't actually talk about that investigation. And so it's very, very conflicty of interesty, isn't it? If the president who runs the executive branch, who runs the FBI, FBI is investigating the president's son, you see how that little chain might be problematic, how it all sort of you know spirals back up there, might be a conflict of interest, in fact, a big one. So now, of course, things get a little bit uncomfortable. And after these questions, it's about you know, it's four hours, three, four hours, Christopher Ray's like, gosh, you know, ugh, I'm over this. You guys are such losers. Do you know who I am? I'm the director of the FBI. I run things around here. And so he tells them, and Columbia Bugle caught this one, a good follow over on Twitter, says, Columbia Bugle says, at Columbia Bugle, you have got to be kidding me. What is more important than answering questions about the FBI's actions under oath from senators elected by the American people, Ray? And this is what happens. Christopher Ray has to just 
skadoodle on out of there. Here he is. Senator, I, I uh, had had a flight that I'm supposed to be hightailing it to out of here. Hightailing. Um, I had understood that we were going to be done at 1.30, so that was, that's how we ended up where we are. If it's your, if it's your business trip, you got your own plane. Can it wait a while? Sorry, to be honest, um, I, I've, I've tried to make my break as fast as I could to get right back out of here. Yeah, so you took resume. more than five minutes. <laughs> you took more than five minutes. This is a tight ship, Mr. Director. Uh, listen, I, I don't recall mentioning in a second round. I want to accommodate as many as I can and still be respectful of the fact that this is your third appearance in two years before this committee, what? and I appreciate that very much. And Third appearance in front of the committee to again deliver no answers. So that's Christopher Ray. You see after just a short couple hours this morning in front of really kind of a limited set of questions. You've got Ted Cruz, you've got Marsha Blackburn asking good questions, but not getting any answers because Christopher Ray, first of all, well, he's the FBI. He runs things around there and it's time for him to go. He decided, had enough of this. I'm out of here. And everybody's just like, okay, I guess... Uh, See ya. So there you go, my friends. That is Ted Cruz and the Judiciary Committee versus Christopher Ray. We'll see if there's any other substantive information that comes out of it. I wouldn't hold your breath. All right. And so we have another segment, my friends, to get into. I saw a couple super chats come in. Bear Ashby is here. He says that agent should be fired, not looking at January 6th. I agree. I mean, it was a bad performance of that guy. Mark Owens here with a super chat. No, no question, but thank you, Mark Owens. Thanks for being here on that one. Bear Ashby with another one. We saw that one. T4 says, please cover GWACS versus KE. Something Arizona is from 15. Forgotten Weapons did a summary YouTube bib. Someone from LawTube needs to cover it. Gold mine of content. Okay, so I think he actually linked the YouTube. Well, that's pretty interesting. I've not seen that in a chat before, but thank you for that T4. And um, those were the super chats that came in on that segment. And so we're going to jump into our next segment. And we've got Peter Navarro, who, of course, is uh, in the house. Lots to cover here. And so we're going to try to kind of fly through this one as as uh, expeditiously as we can, expediently as we can, without missing any of the finer points. Peter Navarro now facing two attempts against him from the Department of Justice. We've got one criminal prosecution for contempt of Congress. We have another now lawsuit that was filed to seek to get control over his Proton Mail account. You see Peter Navarro is here. Several things we're going to cover. First, we're going to look at a civil demand and go through what that means and what that involves. We're also going to look at the criminal case docket and get an update there. So I want to show you now the two different sort of uh, areas of law, the criminal case and the civil case. Here we have Peter Navarro, the civil case, and this got filed very, very recently. On August 3rd, there was a complaint filed against Navarro with a whole slew of exhibits. And you can see there's been activity leading up to today, August 4th, order establishing procedures for the judge who got assigned the case. So very fresh case, right? Not a lot here because it's brand new. Notice of appearance entered on behalf of the United States and the case has been assigned to a judge, but no information about Peter Navarro getting a, a, an attorney, no indication that there's a sort of any legal counsel who's representing him yet. But when we take a look at the actual complaint, I wanna show you what he is attempting or what's, what's attempting to be done here. So this is the lawsuit that was filed. It is a civil case you see here, 13 pages long, filed August 3rd, and it is United States of America, Peter Navarro. And it is a civil case, but it's, it's about getting presidential records back under the custody of the United States government. So let's go through this. It says, Peter Navarro was employed at the White House when he was working for Trump from January 2017 to January 2021, Deputy Assistant, National Trade Council, and all of those things. In March 2020, he appointed Navarro to coordinate the government's use of the Defense Production Act to help with COVID. Okay, so this guy's sort of been highly involved 
in the federal government. The Presidential Records Act is going to be the subject of this suit, creates a framework for the preservation of presidential records. Subject to conditions and exceptions not relevant here, you've got to keep your records. The United States retains control over your emails, over your records, over your text messages. Okay, so anybody who works in the federal government or sort of in the presidential administration, they've got to comport with this law. Among other responsibilities here, any presidential records sent on non-official electronic messages must be accounted for, must be turned over and transferred over to the National Archives at the conclusion of the administration. At the end of the administration, the archivist takes control of those records. And they say here that while serving in the White House, Mr. Navarro used at least one non-official email account called Proton Mail. Proton Mail, of course, is that that mail server that's supposed to be ultra secure, ultra private. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about that topic. The Antikiss on our locals channel said that maybe it was a, a honeypot, right, to sort of capture people. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but there are a lot of theories about that. But the point is, right, it's supposed to be a hardened email server and it is supposed to be difficult to sort of be turned over to authorities. And so they want that now. Mr. Navarro did not copy each email with presidential records to his official government email account. And following the end of the Trump administration, the DOJ says the general counsel of the archives tried to contact Navarro to get his compliance with this rule. Prior to filing the suit to avoid litigation, we sent many notices to Navarro saying that you have to turn this stuff over to us. All of that has proven to be unsuccessful. Now they say Navarro is wrongfully retaining those records. The wrongful retention is in violation of the law. And they're asking the court, order Mr. Navarro to transmit those records over to the United States. They're saying those are our records. We're the National Archive. The law says that those become ours after the administration is over. He's sent emails that are not in our possession. Judge, order him to give those to us award other relief that the court deems appropriate. So we've got some of the standard stuff here. The different parties are involved. We already know who Mr. Navarro is. We already know who the United States is, of course, the government. The Presidential Records Act, this is the law that details why Peter Navarro must send this stuff over, according to them. They have some factual background for us. February 2017, the White House Counsel's Office issued a memo about non-official email accounts. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. Navarro served as the deputy assistant to the president in many different roles. He used at least one non-official email during the subcommittee with the coronavirus. And through the subcommittee's work, the archivist became aware of the use of the non-official email account. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about this. Let's, let's poke around some of the exhibits. So now, here is that exhibit that they referenced. Okay, so Peter Navarro is working in the Trump White House right now. It's February 22nd, 2017, so rewind the clock. They come in. President Trump's counsel to the president, Don McGahn, sends this out. Trump's in office now, right? And he says, hey, remind all people here, we've got the Presidential Records Act. What are the Records Act? It says anything that your emails, paper records and electronic records. It says you are required to conduct all work-related communications on your official email account. That's executive office of the presidency. Okay, so they filed this as an exhibit and they say that all of this was disclosed over to Mr. Navarro. So Mr. Navarro now gets this copy and through the work on that committee, they see this email. So this is the sort of exhibit two that they filed in addition to this suit. They said here that we got this email from this guy, Stephen Hatfill. And I think that, no, it's not this guy, but it, this is the email from Stephen Hatfill. And look, it says to Peter Navarro at protonmail.com. So they're looking at the header of the email and they say, Oh, there it is. There's your email. It doesn't look like, you know, uh, at, at the White House, right, or EOP or anything like that. It says protonmail.com. That's not an official archival email. Therefore, you're using an email and it doesn't look like you copied anything anywhere else. So here, right, all of this is just sort of a back and forth about the COVID stuff. Stephen Hatfield sends another email in March 16, 2020, when stuff is hitting the fan at that moment. They're sort of revising these, uh, the, this, you know, recommendation document, more documents from Stephen Hatfield. And this is a big document, right? 80, 80 uh, 20 pages long. And it's just sort of a bunch of emails back and forth from Peter Navarro's Proton address. 
Here we see that back on December 16th, 2021, now the administration has changed powers. Trump and Peter Navarro, they're out and the Biden White House has taken over. So we have a, a, a letter who comes over from the National Archives. It says, Dear Mr. Navarro, I'm here on behalf of NARA, the National Archives. It's come to our attention that you had a Proton Mail dot com address and the select committee posted multiple examples from emails right the committee's going out there and they're finding other people who sent emails to peter navarro and they're saying where'd that email come from oh proton mail what's he in violation of well the the, the national archives laws the presidential records act and so they send that all over to the doj the doj is now filing suit in order to get those emails to bring them back in within the purview of the National Archives. We have conducted a search of the White House emails that NARA received at the end of the Trump administration, and we have no record of you forwarding any emails from your Proton Mail account. There are also multiple instances where you sent emails from your personal account to other employees, but did not copy your account. So you're required to do that, and so give it all over to us. This comes from Gary M. Stern, White House Counsel. And Mr. Navarro, of course, did not do that. Naro's counsel wrote a letter, and we just read that. Stern explained that we tried to find the stuff and we couldn't. And they sent a number of other letters. Now, Navarro did not respond to the letter. The COO of the National Archives, this guy is William Basanco. He says, I'm currently the COO uh, for the National Archives. And I know that we've been trying to get Navarro's Proton emails and he has not responded and we sent all of these emails and uh, he has not returned anything and he's not complied, right? None of the property has been returned. So the complaint continues. Then on June 1st, this year, 2022, now that we know they've been trying to get all this stuff back, Navarro writes a letter, is written a letter from the DOJ and that is this final letter, it's here. Okay, June 1, just, just over two months ago. Mr. Navarro, you conducted official business as an advisor to President Trump, and you used a private email account. Presidential Record Act says that's illegal. We have been authorized to file a civil action against you in the U.S. District Court to recover our wrongfully withheld records. We intend to file the action in June, and of course they have done that now. If you have any questions about this matter, email the DOJ. Signed from Elizabeth Shapiro out of the Civil Division for the federal DOJ. The letter sent went, went out to him. Then on June 16th, lawyers for, for Navarro contacted them, say, we've just been retained. They say, we're gonna be working with you. We've got periodic updates. But an email came out July 22nd. They say they have 1,700 documents. And then they refuse to produce any of those records. Okay, so now they're saying that even Navarro's lawyers are not giving us anything. So count one, they say Navarro has possession and custody of these documents, and therefore we need to go get those back. None of the official electronic emails included copies, and therefore Navarro has unjustly retained property, right? Those emails are the US property according to them, and he has to turn those over. Also count two, same thing, right? He's also in possession of government documents. And so they're asking the court to authorize the recovery of these records, issue an order requiring Navarro to cooperate with the official serving and implementation of the writ of replevin, which is the return of the documents, and other similar order to ensure the presidential records go back to the United States. There it is. Okay, so he's got another civil action, 13 pages long, filed against him and signed off on by three different federal prosecutors and a trial attorney, Lee Reeves. So four people there, all submitting this against Mr. Navarro. Now that is in the civil case. Now the civil case is to return the emails. The criminal case, as we'll see here, involves the contempt of Congress charges. And so I want to share with you something that just got filed today in the Peter Navarro case. You see, it's pretty quiet as of recently. The last update until today was on July 15th. We had a status conference and there was not a lot of activity there. Our next court date was going to be scheduled on August 11th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Okay, so that's the next court date in about a few days from now. What is that? Seven days from now. We'll have that court date and we'll see what happens. It's publicly accessible. So call in and uh, we can see maybe if, if we can find a good tweet thread for that one. 
But I wanted to share this with you. Okay, look today, August 4th, motion to compel filed by who? Peter Navarro. And it's got a bunch of different attachments and exhibits. And so I have not gone through this in detail because it literally just hit the docket today. And I want to share this with you now. It's 44 pages long. Oh my goodness. That's a lot. So let's see what we can piece together here. This is United States of America versus Peter Navarro. It is the defendant's, so Peter's, motion to compel discovery. And discovery is a very important part of any criminal case. Remember, the government prosecutor, they have everything. They have all the reports. They've got all the body cameras. They've got all the test results. They've got the entire file. So you need to get that stuff if you're a defendant in order to properly prepare and defend for your case. Here, as we can see, they're referencing some of the cases you probably know and may have heard of, like Brady, where we talk about exculpatory information, information that might tend to prove a defendant's innocence, has to be disclosed over to the defense. And they're referencing this. They say, oh my goodness, look at this. In this motion, they are referencing a quote. This is beautiful. From Molly Gaston who was the prosecuting attorney in the Steve Bannon case. Look at this. <laughs> so they're going through her void deer. It's not opening statements, it's from void deer. It's when she's asking the jurors questions if, if they're gonna get on the Steve Bannon trial. And they quote her. They say, she said, quote, we shouldn't be disqualifying people just because they believe the work of the committee or the functioning of the government is important. Shouldn't be disqualifying people. Let's see where this goes. The government's view of this case is perhaps best encapsulated in this one sentence and is foreborn in the minimal discovery, just 633 documents and 2,600 pages produced by the government to date. So 2,600 pages, right? Sounds like a lot, but when you put it in context of January 6th, it's probably not all that much, probably a lot more than that. In short, the government, according to Navarro's defense, has determined that the U.S. House Select Committee to investigate the Capitol, the Select Committee, is properly constituted. The government determined the subpoena, the Select Committee that they issued to Navarro was valid and enforceable. And the government determined that President Trump's invocation of executive privilege as to his closest aides and advisors was of no consequence. All this before either this court or Navarro had an opportunity to scrutinize the government's rationale or its conclusions. This is not a simple misdemeanor prosecution. It's a test of separation of powers as between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And the only forum for this dispute to be resolved is this court. The prosecution of Navarro cannot stand if both the U.S. Congress and the U.S. DOJ have failed to follow every procedural process to which he is entitled under the law. Okay, so this is going to be a due process argument, right? That the commit at due, well, two things, due process and a separation of powers argument, due process saying that, okay, look, if you want to prosecute anybody in this country, you got to follow criminal procedure because the base layer that we have in, in the United States is the constitution and you can't dip below those protections. And we've codified through our case law. It's not codified. It's, it's, it's precedent and case law we've established sort of the, the boundaries of due process. And we say, look, you know, we know that some proceedings have indicia of due process and others do not. And so what they're arguing here is that the January 6th committee, the government has decided on their own externally from the courts that their process is due, right? That what the January 6th committee has done is affording due process in their proceedings. And that has not happened in my opinion, because there it's not adversarial. There's no adversarial process at all. So they're trying to make that argument that it's invalid on that basis. Now, there's a lot of procedural history here. We're going to fast forward through this. And I really want to see sort of what they are. Look, okay, so lots of redactions here. Uh, big blocks there. Discovery principles, argument. Let's take a quick look at the argument. Given the allegations in the indictment and applicable law, the government is required to search for additional sources of potentially discoverable information and provide it to Navarro. Instead here, the government has apparently deliberately shielded itself from the knowledge of information that it would, that would otherwise be pertinent to several defenses. Okay, so in other words, the government is just not looking under the mattress in certain rooms because they know if they lift up that mattress, they are not gonna like what they find under there. Not gonna like it at all. So they're just not looking. And Navarro is saying, look, if you've got some dirty, corrupt cops under that mattress. If you've got some information that might be exculpatory, 
you've got to lift it up and look. And they're saying the prosecutors are not doing that. So, right, this is a this is a pretty hefty motion here. There's some redactions. Let's see what this is. Talking about Mr. Sue. Navarro received a letter and, and uh, yeah, the government must provide information that is material. So it's pretty much a standard, you know, motion to compel. There's some redactions in here. Let's see what they're asking for at the end as we scroll down to the bottom. The following specific additional requests listed in the defendant's letter to the government, all redacted. Ah, that's what we wanted. That's the highlight of the whole document. Darn it. They want these things. <laughs> it's all redacted. Darn it. Okay, you can see here, redacted. So they want this thing, and they want that thing, and they want that thing, and they want that thing. They want the government to be compelled to give them all this stuff, but we don't know what it is, darn it. Here, redacted, another one, redacted, 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 redacted. J, all warrants and subpoenas used by the government to obtain information in this case. Okay, well, that's good. And uh, no details about those warrants though. And then they also want all correspondence with the Justice Department and Jonathan Sue or anyone else in the White House Counsel's office. Signed off on by John Rowley III, John Irving, both these guys out of DC. And uh, here's the certificate of service, but we don't get to see what they're actually demanding. Ah, bummer. <laughs> what a disappointment. I, you know, I attached that document. I was thinking, oh, it's going to be juicy here. Now, here, here, here's a little bit of, you know, some stuff, I guess. All documents that are favorable to the defense. Yeah, all documents and other evidence establishing the select committee was properly established pursuant to House 503. The, the prosecutors are going to respond to that and they're just going to say, we don't have to give you that. You know, it's not our obligation to prepare this for you. And uh, I'm going to guess that some of this was already disclosed. So th this is this is a battle, a pretty common battle that exists in criminal law. And we don't get to see sort of the details on the, of those redaction requests, redacted requests. But you can imagine that there is some good stuff in there. And we have always been asking questions about January 6th and trying to figure out exactly what went on there. But as I mentioned, Peter Navarro will be back in court and that's gonna be taking place on August 11th. So just about a week away for a status conference. And we'll see if there's anything substantive that happens there. So now Peter Navarro, two different cases that he's having to sort of field and fight against a civil case, to return the Proton emails and the criminal case with the status conference on August 11th. And we will, of course, continue to follow Peter Navarro and all of the other January 6th cases, and I hope you join us on that journey. All right, my friends, and so we've got one final segment on the program today. Sean Brem is here. He says, how did the government find out that he had a Proton mail account unless they were violating his constitutional right to privacy? He needs to counter sue. So Sean, yeah, it's a good question. And I had the same question, actually, when we started this whole thing. I was wondering, uh, you know, yeah, how, how did they get it? And they sort of explained that. You probably submitted your chat before I, I think I explained it. But there was, remember the J6 committee, right? They went on this big fishing expedition. They sent out a ton of subpoenas and a ton of letters to people all over the country. And they said, just give us everything, right? Give us all of your emails, all of your text messages. And a lot of people complied. A lot of people just voluntarily handed it on over. And once they got that, they started cross-referencing everything. They said, okay, so what's, what's your name, William? Who'd you send, who'd you work with in the Trump administration? List everybody that you ever sent an email to. And so William goes back and he sits there and he says, okay, let me go through my inbox. And he, uh, uh, this guy, 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 okay. Oh, and they say, oh, Peter Navarro's on that list. We hate that guy, perfect. You sent him emails, let me see all the emails that you sent over to Navarro. And he pulls them all up and they say, oh, Proton Mail. Mm very curious, right? And they've got teams of lawyers and probably interns and law school students combing through all of these records, trying to piece it together. And then that's what led them to refer this back over to the DOJ and say, hey, he's got a Proton Mail account. Now we want to file a, a, a suit with the court in order to obtain those emails because they say that they are government property. But that right, that's how they connect the dots. It's kind of a standard investigation that you know, they just get one little, they open the door, they got to get one little nibble and then they're going to jump into more. First domino, where does it go? Bear Ashby says, tell them you want to reduce, tell them you want to reduce Tate for blackouts.
I don't know what you're talking about, Bear Ashby. Want to reduce Tate for blackouts. Like, like, is that like a hangover cure? Like blacking out drunk or like the electrical blackouts that we're probably going to be having in this country soon. I don't know, but we're going to jump into our final segment for the day before we jump into your comments, your thoughts, your questions, and our friends over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We've got our Brianna Taylor segment here. It's been a long time since we've talked about Brianna Taylor. Let's see what we have here. Uh, okay. Brianna Taylor, we're queuing up. And four police officers, current and former, out of Louisville, Kentucky, have been arrested and indicted for charges related to Brianna Taylor. You see a picture of her here. We've covered a lot of this on this channel. And today we're going to piece together these new and recent developments, starting with the announcement that came out from Merrick Garland. You see the AP was reporting this today. They said that the DOJ has announced civil rights charges against four Louisville police officers over the drug raid that led to the death of Breonna Taylor. Charges range from unlawful conspiracies, use of force, and obstruction of justice, Merrick Garland told us. So we'll take a look at what the attorney general said and as well take a look at the press release that came out from the official DOJ Civil Rights Division. But we'll spend the bulk of our time unpacking the charges. Okay, these are the four individuals who were ultimately federally charged. You see there was an indictment that brought charges against this guy, Kyle Meany, current sergeant out of Louisville. He's 35 years old. We also have Joshua Janes, who was a former detective, age 40. And the allegations are that these people were involved in falsifying a warrant that gave them permission to go into Breonna Taylor's apartment that ultimately resulted in the shootout that left Breonna Taylor dead and bullets flying through the properties of the neighbors, right? This was an apartment complex. The way this went down is law enforcement sort of did this sort of, you know, sort of after hours, apparently no knocks. They say they knocked raid broke into this apartment and the boyfriend of Brianna Taylor fired back at the officers. There was gunfire that exchanged and it left Brianna Taylor dead. So big investigation that took place. All of this happened March, 2020. And you know, this, this really has been under investigation for quite some time. Joshua Janes was a part of that. He has been indicted. We had a second indictment that went to Brett Hankinson, which was really the shooter, the individual who was behind the gun that fired the bullets sort of haphazardly throughout the apartment building. And we have a new face. We hadn't heard of this woman yet. Kelly Goodlett. She was a detective or maybe current detective. And she also got charged. Now she was not charged for the the same, she was actually charged differently. She was charged with an information, which is more of a direct complaint process rather than a grand jury indictment. So there's kind of two ways you can be charged. One is by presenting your evidence and getting a probable cause determination through a grand jury. The other is through a preliminary hearing and you establish probable cause that way. And then once that's established, then you would file the information. And it's, it's two ways to get to the same final juncture, but they're just two different sort of routes to get there. So it's a little bit in the weeds, but that's why I have them spread out this way and sort of separated this way. Here, let's take a look at the announcement from the DOJ, Merrick Garland, when he announced all of this. I think this is the first part of it. Yes, here he is. He comes out and says the following. Good morning, everyone. Earlier today, I spoke with the family of Brianna Taylor. This morning, they were informed that the Justice Department has charged four current and former Louisville Metro Police Department officers with federal crimes related to Ms. Taylor's death. Those alleged crimes include civil rights offenses, unlawful conspiracies, unconstitutional use of force, and obstruction offenses. The four defendants were charged through two separate indictments and one information. All right, so we're going to go through each one of those. Here is a different explanation from Merrick Garland before we take a look at the actual charges. Here he is sort of detailing what, this is new, right? This is some new information about why these charges are coming out. And it's in, in, in particular, I'm interested in the conspiracy charges and some of the cover-up allegations about what these officers did after they were under investigation. We allege that the defendants knew their actions in falsifying the affidavit could create a dangerous situation. And we allege these unlawful acts resulted in Ms. Taylor's death. 
The charges announced today also alleged that the officers responsible for falsifying the affidavit that led to the search took steps to cover up their unlawful conduct after Ms. Taylor was killed. We allege that defendants Jaynes and Goodlett conspired to knowingly falsify an investigative document Whoa. that was created after Ms. Taylor's death. Wow. So they falsified documents to cover up their tracks. Let's listen. We also allege that they conspired to mislead federal, state, and local authorities who were investigating the incident. For example, we allege that in May 2020, those two defendants met in a garage where they agreed to tell investigators a false story. Wow. The indictment separately alleges that defendant Meany lied to the FBI during its investigation of this matter. Lied to the FBI, huh? So that means, right, if this happened in March 2020, they met and they spoke with investigators in May 2020. They're saying that they actually lied about that. And so we'll break that down. Here is the official press release that came out from the DOJ, and we'll see the different uh, individuals who are going to be working on this case. Federal grand jury Louisville, Kentucky returned two indictments unsealed today. We've covered this. We already heard from Merrick Garland. First indictment charges Louisville LMPD Detective Joshua James, age 40. Federal civil rights violations, obstruction charges, Kelly Goodlett and others. And so actually, we don't need to spend much time on this. I just want to show you this is here. And the different people who are prosecuting this case are here. Uh, Michael J. Songer, Anna Gutfried, Civil Rights Division. And so we've got them detailed out here on our mind map. Now, to the good stuff, this is the actual indictment. Remember, these are the two individuals who are responsible under the first indictment, Kyle Meany and Joshua Janes, so age 35, current ser sergeant and a former detective. And all of this emanated from drug charges, right? They were investigating drug crimes. And so I saw a comment in here, you know, uh, gosh, I forget who said it, but somebody said, yeah, if you're in Kentucky and you break into somebody's house in the middle of the night, you can expect somebody to fire back. And I think that is sort of a reasonable observation. But this is the first indictment. So this came out, and these are not super long. This is nine pages, and we can see what it says for us here. It uh, filed August 3rd, Western District of Kentucky, U.S. District Court, United States of America versus those two guys, Joshua Jane and Kyle Meany. The grand jury came out, and so they presented this evidence to you know actual citizens of Kentucky, and they said, hey, this is what we've got. Do you think there's enough here? And they said yes. Brianna Taylor, 26-year-old woman, March 2020, lived in apartment number four in Springfield, at Springfield Drive. Louisville LMPD in late 2019 formed a unit called PBI, Place Based Investigations. Early 2020, they were investigating alleged narcotics trafficking, trafficking in Louisville, 10 miles away from Taylor's home. Kyle Meany, who we showed you, he was a sergeant, supervised the PBI unit. He was employed since 2013. Joshua James, a detective in the PBI unit, started early 2020, worked for them for 15 years. KG is a, a, an acronym, we don't know who that is, was a detective. Actually, that's going to be Kelly Goodlett. Okay, that's who she is. On March 12, 2020, PBI using affidavits, so the search warrants that were authorized by Joshua James and Kyle Meany, got warrants to search five properties. Told the judge, these are all good. We filled it out. Here's the time we want to go. Here's what we're looking for. Four properties in Louisville that were allegedly used in drug trafficking. Also, Taylor's home, apartment four. Primary target of the investigation was JG, a man who had been previously arrested for committing drug offenses. Joshua Janes and Kyle Meany, both Louisville police officers, they knew that the affidavit used to obtain the warrant to search Taylor's home contained information that was false, misleading, and out of date. The affidavit admitted material and the officers lacked probable cause for the search. They're saying they just falsified the whole thing. Let's see what this says. Janes and Meany, both officers, knew the execution of the search warrant would be carried out by armed LMPD officers and would create a dangerous situation for anyone near Taylor's home. On March 13, 1245 a.m., okay, so sort of middle of the night, LMPD officers who had not been involved in drafting the search warrant and who were unaware of the false statements contained in the search warrant went to Taylor's home. 
When those officers broke down the home to the apartment, a guest in Taylor's home, Kenneth Walker, KW, believing the intruders were breaking in, immediately fired one shot with a handgun he lawfully possessed, hitting the first officer at the door. Two LMPD officers filed a total, fired a total of 22 shots into the apartment, and one of those shots hit Breonna Taylor in the chest. So they break in, Kenneth Walker fires back, totally lawful, totally legal, Second Amendment, self-defense, the castle doctrine, defending your home. And the police say, oh, what did you do? 22 bullets going flying all over the place. And Breonna Taylor then is now dead. And they false, you know, the, the actual officers who authorized that warrant falsified the whole thing. A third officer moved from the doorway to the side of the apartment and fired 10 more shots through a window and a sliding glass door, both of which were covered with blinds and curtains, just firing like a lunatic <laughs> all the way through the apartment. Taylor died from the wound to her chest. Count one, deprivation of rights under color of law. Joshua Jaynes and others were acting under color of law, aiding and abetting other officers, violating people's rights to be free from unreasonable searches. Joshua Jaynes drafted and swore out the affidavit and the warrant, knowing the warrant would be executed with armed officers, but still provided false and misleading statements. He omitted material information, relied on stale information, and it was not supported by probable cause. Kyle Meany approved the warrant. He had more experience knowing the warrant would be executed and knowing the same things. They all involved a dangerous weapon at the time. Beginning not later, so count two on a conspiracy. Now, this is after the fact. Remember, all of this started in March. Then April happens. Breonna Taylor shot and killed. The whole situation exploded. Joshua Jaynes and Meany are sitting around going, we're in deep doo-doo here. And so they come up with a plan, not later than in or around April 2020 and continuing until uh, June 2020 in the Western District and elsewhere, the sort of establishing jurisdiction. Janes knowingly conspired and agreed with Kelly Goodlett, who we'll talk about, and others to knowingly falsify a document to impede an investigation with the FBI, a federal agent, to stop the FBI from properly investigating this case. Number two, they knowingly engaged in misleading conduct towards the other person to hinder and delay federal law enforcement officials. They talk about the manner, means, and the object of the conspiracy. The object was to cover up the fact that the Springfield Drive warrant was false, misleading, and stale. And what did they do? They submitted a false investigative letter and they made false statement to criminal investigators. They had a manner and a means in this conspiracy. They adopted, expanded upon the warrants affidavit, and they sort of expanded upon it. So they, they layered on another letter after the fact. They said, oh, this warrant's bad. Well, let's just layer something else on top. It's doubling down on the lie. It was further, in furtherance of the conspiracy, Janes and KG called and texted, and they met with each other, and they discussed the false information. So they got their emails and their phone calls and their text messages. Hey, what should we say? Where should we meet? What should we talk about? They coordinated their false stories in an attempt to escape responsibilities for their roles. They also furthered the conspiracy by contacting other officers and pressuring them to provide false information in support of the warrant. Further, further conspiracy from KG making false statements to others as this unfolded. We've got some overt acts here in or around April to May. Janes and a fellow officer, JM, he, he, he called JM. So Joshua Janes calls this guy, you know, let's say, you know, uh, we'll call him Joe. He says, hey, JM. He says, JG had received packages at Taylor's apartment. He said, try to get JM to say that he had previously told Joshua Janes that JG had received packages at Taylor's apartment. So he says, hey, Joe, can you help me out here? Can you say that you got packages at Taylor's apartment? In fact, JM had told Joshua Janes that in January 2020, he had no information showing that JG received packages at that apartment. And during a post-shooting call in April, JM again told Joshua Janes he was unaware of any information at Taylor's apartment. Nothing. No information at all. And he calls him back. Hey, can you, hey, can you just say this? Like a couple of high school kids. Hey, can you tell mom that I'm staying at Bobby's tonight? Uh, yeah, no problem. Sure, I'll tell them. After having been told by two officers that the Shively Police Department in April 2020 that JG had not received packages at Taylor's home, Joshua wrote in a letter, okay, he, he wrote in a letter 
that he had, quote, verified through JM of the LMPD who contacted the Postal Service that JG had been receiving packages at Taylor's address. So he just lied about it. <laughs> he says, hey, can you cover for me? No. Well, he puts it in the report anyways. Joshua Jaynes and Kelly included in the investigative letter the misleading claim that a detective, quote, was able to verify through CLEAR, a law enforcement database, that JG used that Brianna Taylor's residence as his address. Joshua Jaynes and KG both knew at the time the statement was misleading because as they knew, JG did not live there in February. So they were misreporting. They also say that KG, Kelly, reviewed a draft of the letter sent to her by Josh. So Josh types this up. What do you think of this letter? Sends it over to Kelly. Kelly says, well, change this word. Uh, you forgot the apostrophe on that. Uh, add in here uh, that you're innocent. Okay. Containing the claim that JM had verified the addresses. Knowing the statement was false, KG failed to change the statement or to object to it. She signed on the letter, which included the false statement. So she said, no, that looks good. It totally covers my butts. Covers yours. Perfect. On or about May now, we fast forward. They signed and submitted the letter that they had jointly drafted to PBI. Joshua and KG knew the letter was false and misleading. May comes around 2020 after media outlets reported that a postal inspector had announced that JG had not received packages at Taylor's address as alleged in the affidavit. Joshua sent a text over to Kelly that a criminal investigator wanted to meet with him the following day. And he went over to Kelly's uh, uh, garage that night. These two people, Joshua Jane's meeting in Kelly's garage. He calls her. He says, or he texts her, Kelly, I'm in deep trouble over here. I've got a criminal investigator who's breathing down my neck. We got to get together and talk about this. You know that letter I sent you that was full of lies? Yeah, he wants to know about it. She goes, oh, crap. Did I sign that too? Yeah, you did. Where do you want to meet? Let's go in my garage. Perfect. When Joshua Jaynes and KG meet in the garage the evening of May 17th, Joshua tells KG they got to get on the same page because they could both go down for putting false information in the Spring Drive Warren affidavit. We're in deep crap here, Kelly. You should take this seriously. During the meeting in the garage, Jaynes and KG agreed to tell investigators a false story. So they cracked one of them and they're turned, claiming that J uh, probably Kelly. I'm guessing they, they turned Kelly, which is why they've got yeah, the information went against her. Claiming that JM had told them in January 2020 that JG was receiving packages at Taylor's home. So they, they fibbed the whole thing. We now see August 12th, fast forward, KG falsely tells investigators with the Kentucky AG that in January, JM in passing, in passing, right? Now, <laughs> so, you know, he told me like at the gym when we were on the treadmill together told KG and Joshua Jaynes that, that he verified JG was getting packages at Taylor's home. Total nonsense. On or about June 14th, during an interview with agents, Joshua Jaynes falsely, so he held his lie all the way up until 2020, falsely claimed that in January 2020, JM made a nonchalant comment that JG was getting mail or Amazon packages at Taylor's home. All So these people... You know, now they change it from like, no, it was official. This was all legitimate and part of the record to, no, he mentioned it like at the gym. We were at dinner. We had a couple cocktails. He said, yeah, you know, that Taylor's home was getting a lot of drugs. And they acted on it. Liars. Corrupt as can be. Count three. On or about May 1, 2020, Joshua Jaynes acting in relation with the FBI, knowingly falsified a document to impede or obstruct the FBI's investigation. He knew that this investigative letter would be used in preparation for a criminal investigation, and he lied in it anyways. He made materially false statements in count four. He falsely told an agent with the FBI that a paragraph requesting authority to make a no-knock entry at Taylor's home was included in the warrant because officers on the SWAT unit had, during a preliminary meeting on March 5th, asked for a no-knock authority at that location. In truth, and in fact, Calamini knew the SWAT did not ask PBI to request a no knock entry. So he lied about the knockability of it, well, whether it was knock or no knock. Signed off on by the grand jurors here, indicting those two guys. So you see, Joshua Jange is this guy. He was the one meeting with Kelly Goodlett. You know, uh, you know, they were pretty close with each other. I don't know what the relationship is looking like there, but they met in her garage. 
it's like a bad Netflix movie or something. And they're sitting around trying to concoct a scheme to get out of the whole thing. So that was the first indictment. We have the second indictment, which is Brett Hankinson. Now we've talked a lot about him. This one's relatively short. Grand jury charges, the same thing here, telling us that Breonna Taylor is 26 years old. Kenneth Walker, 28 years old. CN was a 20, is a 24 year old woman at the time. And these were the people in the apartment who lived next door to Breonna Taylor. Okay, so he gets charged. Hankinson was the guy who was sort of shooting all over the place like a Looney Tune. Recklessly endangering everybody in the building because he was so panicked. Now he, and to be fair to him, right, he didn't know what the hell was going on. He got a fake warrant crafted by his other people, his compatriots. On March 12, LMPD, the PBI unit, got warrants, seven officers executed the search warrant. When he went in there, he got, let's see here. When officers broke down the door, Kenneth Walker fired one shot with a handgun that he lawfully possessed. Two MPD officers returned fire and Brett Hankison moved from the doorway to the side of the apartment and fired 10 more shots through a window and a sliding glass door. <laughs> Both of which were covered with blinds and curtains. Uh, so can you picture this? Can you see what happened here? You've got two officers who crack through the door, right? They bust the door down and they're standing there in the door frame and they're, they're, you know, looking for the target so that they can shoot. And they're not just haphazardly firing rounds through, you know, door buildings. And Hankinson thinks he's in a Hollywood movie. So he sort of, you know, gets out of the doorway and he just starts firing through the window because he's going to take out anybody who's standing there shooting bullets. Well, somebody hit Breonna Taylor. They say that on March 13th, he acted under the color of law and violated civil rights of Breonna Taylor. Similarly, uh, violated the rights of the neighbors. Okay, CN, ZF, CE, saying that they were right to be free from people shooting bullets through their doors and that Brett Hankinson didn't do that, saying he fired five bullets into the living room of the apartment through a sliding glass door that was covered with blinds and curtains. Multiple bullets traveled through the wall of apartment four into apartment three, endangering CN, ZF, and CE used a dangerous weapon and he was intending to kill people, which is obviously true. So, uh, you know, just, just ridiculous. Now, all of them got charged. The last one who got charged in an information is Kelly Goodlett. And this one is eight pages, it's very similar. She's the opposite of basically Joshua Janes, right? The, uh, she's on the other side of this. And she has been, her case has been percolating a lot longer than the other three, which is why I think they probably had, they probably cracked her and she was the one who spilled the beans on Joshua Janes. They said, listen, you're, you're going to get indicted or you can cooperate with us and tell us what happened here. And she said, whatever you need, I'll tell you whatever you want. So she did. Meanwhile, Joshua Janes, he's working his way through this process as late as June. He's still lying to the FBI. He's like, no, 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 no. Kelly and I were good. She would never turn on me. She did. She's singing like a canary in the next room. So Joshua Janes is here. Uh, he was a detective of PBI. March 12th, they obtained warrants. Four properties, March 13th, they executed the officers, or the warrants, and Taylor died. Goodlit, Kelly, knowingly and willfully conspired to falsify the warrant affidavit, made misleading statements, and it's basically the same thing, right? She was working with Joshua Janes to do it. On March 10th, she told Joshua Janes that the search warrant did not contain enough recent information connecting Taylor or her home to criminal activity. So she objected to it. She added a paragraph to the affidavit that she knew was misleading, which stated that she had verified from databases that this was a current home address. Didn't do that. After the postal inspector reported on this, Joshua texted Kelly, we got to meet. They met in the garage said, we got to get on the same page. Kelly agreed to tell investigators a false story along with Joshua. Two days after the meeting, they met with the public integrity unit and they both changed their stories. That he was told in passing, right? There it is. So those are the, that's the information that was filed against Kelly Goodlett. What a bunch of crooks. All right. So those are four officers, seriously bad popo, who have just, you know, apparently just think it's cool to falsify affidavits, break into people's houses, shoot a bunch of ammunition through the side door, try to kill people who are defending themselves with lawfully owned weapons in their property. 
while there's no basis for the police to be there at, at all. That is the update on Brianna Taylor, and I have several of these cases marked for follow-up. When the case cases progress, we'll continue to see where this goes. And of course, I hope you follow us on that journey as we continue to cover this and other stories. And that, my friends, is it for the various segments of the day, which means we've got to turn it over to you and see what you have to say about all of this, starting with our friends over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Let's see who is in the house here. First one I saw says, I didn't tell youngest girl that you were live. She came out of her room and on her way to the kitchen said, tell Rob I said hi. Well, hi, youngest girly. Shout out to the youngest girly and Heather and the three girlies over there starting off the show for us on Locals. John McGarvey says, hey, bud, glad you're back. I think you may do a good job, do too good of a job because there are some crooks in Maricopa County. <laughs> I think you may do too good of a job. I'm a criminal defense attorney. He's like, you're freeing all these crooks. We haven't represented anybody from the Secretary of State's department. So I think, uh, yeah, we haven't, that's not our fault. Next time, pick up the workout. Next time, pick up the workout two weeks before one of you flatlanders travel to the mountains. You'll save the calf burn on the second day. <laughs> John McGarvey's giving me grief over here. And look at John McGarvey. He's got his cowboy hat on. See, he knows what he's talking about. He says, anytime you, you, you city people come out to the mountains, warm up before you get out here, all right? Because I was hiking around all over the base of the Grand Tetons and uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, not, not just the base. We went up to Inspiration Point, baby. We went up to 7,200 feet on the Grand Tetons. It's beautiful. The most, I, we, I saw bears. I saw moose. I saw uh, my mom and my, my, my dad are still there. He sent me a picture of a bald eagle. Insane. Coolest, one of the coolest experiences ever. TOS Forever says, hello, Marvin, miss you too, and welcome home to Rob. Good to see you, TOS Forever. Thunder7 says, I can't figure out if Ray is working for the Patriots or the Swamp, but I'll reserve judgment for now. Paul Sperry said, Director Ray testified a number of people who worked on the Crossfire Hurricane K case are under internal investigation, but suggested none has been fired because probes have been slowed down due to cooperation and assistance with Durham's criminal investigation. Interesting comment there, Thunder7. I did see, actually, that there was... Uh, hmm. I did see that John Durham actually filed a notice of appearance over on the Igor Danchenko case, which is, I think, getting close to a trial. So the trial will... I think it's this year. Yeah, it might, it might be in August. I don't, I don't remember. We'll have to take a look. Three Girlies is here, says, Rob, so the FBI putting out these symbols, isn't that an infringement on the First Amendment? You know, I, yes, but no, you know, so they're going to say that it's not in and of itself sort of a restriction on your speech. You know, we, when, we, when we do free speech analysis, we look at the burdens on the speech. Is it burdening your ability to speak? Yes, arguably, right? If you put a Gadsden flag on your car, you're now the subject of FBI in, in, eyeballs. It's insane, right? So arguably, yes. Now, the FBI is going to get around that and say, well, we don't make any decisions on that. And it's just one variable and a whole slew of other indicia that are relevant. And so it's not, you know, it's not anything that that is out of the ordinary and it doesn't burden speech and i think the courts would probably defer to them on that and give them latitude but she says after all the supreme court said burning the american flag is freedom of speech so why can't you fly or carry the any of the flags that were listed <clears throat> so I, so i think you can right I, I don't think that he was banning them but he's just saying if you do fly that i'm going to think you're a terrorist so it's a burden on speech but it's not a prohibition on speech. Can any of these be challenged in court? Should they decide to use those symbols as a way to press charges? Yes. I mean, if that was like the sole indicia, yes. You'd file a motion to suppress, say this is, there's no probable cause here to charge somebody for flying a flag. That's ridiculous. By the way, I don't see any of the Ohioans putting away their Gadsden flag for the FBI. I find it absolutely hypocritical and ridiculous that they would post any of these flags as extremism. Perhaps the government that's afraid of those flags are truly the tyrants that they're showing themselves to be. Yes. <clears throat> yes. They don't want a flag. I don't know. What, what, what flag do they stand behind? I don't know. It's not the American one, that's for sure. Here is Thunder7 says that document with the flags is meaningless, but what's really meaningful is the ultra mega sweep in Arizona last night. 
You're so lucky, Rob, to live in a state with such patriots. It's good to be here. I'll tell you that. Can we have a Carrie Lake celebration party? You promise? I think we will. Now it's got to be official, right? We got to wait until that's official. But there's a lot of shenanigans going on around here. And, uh, you know, I'm of the mind to just go right down to the Secretary of State's office and see what the heck's going on over there. Ed J says, so my Virginia license plate has the Gazden flag on them. Well, it's nice to see you, Ed, you MVE terrorist, you. Thank you, FBI, for making them a badge of honor. The FBI is one law enforcement organization that should be defunded. They have a role in law enforcement, but they have a long history of corruption. They, apps, they obviously lack integrity at the highest levels, and those people need to go and proper oversight <clears throat> needs to be put in place. I agree with you on that one. That came in from Ed J in the house. Good comment, Ed J. Yeah, the FBI, you know. We also, Sergeant Bob has recommended many times, I think a book on the FBI. J. Edgar, something like that. Thunder Seven says, Alex Jones was set up in court by a rigged verdict. Truly egregious. Robert Barnes apparently is now a part of the case due to a seven second clip where he agreed with Alex's claim that the judge was biased against him and denied him due process. What? What do you mean? <laughs> they subpoenaed him or something? The jury awarded the parents $4 million for Alex hurting their feelings. Whatever happened to the 1A? If they don't want to hurt feelings and don't listen to Alex Jones or anyone else. They are punishing Jones for what a crazed killer did to their children. This woke stuff has got to go. <clears throat> I don't know what happened with Robert Barnes. That's very interesting if the judge is, how is he making him a part of the case? $4 million? Didn't they want 150? It's not, it's not close to 150. If you're preparing, bracing for impact for 150 million, it's 4 million. I think that's a loss for them. If I can be, that's $4 million. It's a lot of money, but it's still, you know, not anywhere close to what they wanted. Tessa Michelle says, after an insurrection, I thought you were going to say take two of these, but it says it is typical that the new government introduces new symbols and eliminates the use of past symbols. Yeah, they're redefining a lot of things in the United States, aren't they? They're defining different words and different relationships and uh, different biological functions and weird times. But it's very important. If you can evaporate the foundation of society, you know, language is very, very important. If you can take over the language, you can take over how people think and how people act. Happy old cat lady. Hey! The name, it used to be Grouchy Old Cat Lady. Not anymore. Now it's Happy Old Cat Lady. Well, isn't that just a beautiful thing? I wonder, I wonder if you're, probably should write a book about that. I mean, I wonder what happened, you know, it's like seven steps or 10 habits or something. I don't know. Peter says, Happy Old Cat Lady. Says Peter should turn over the emails. He's no more above the law than Hillary was. Even if Hillary didn't, he should. Yeah, B. Speck here is, is a happy old cat lady. And happy old cat lady is a very, very uh, principled person. <laughs> it's true. And I, I mean, I say that, right? On our locals community, happy old cat lady is always sort of, well, look, we should just, hey, this is the right thing to do. Just do it. It's the right thing to do. And I'm sitting here, yeah, but they, I, I know, I know we're not supposed to kick them in the nads, but you know, they kicked us in the nads. She's like, well, it's, you're still not supposed to kick them in the nads. And I'm sitting here. Yeah, I know you're not supposed to, but this is the real world here. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful that happy old cat lady is here with us. Congratulations and welcome says, so is the FBI going to take down the Betsy Ross flag? Their website says it's one of the 10 historic flags. They fly 10 historic flags are flanked on either side by today's 50 star flag representing the 50 states of the union. Well, the FBI is, it does really sort of create a bunch of terroristic types of things. So like the Whitmer plot, maybe January 6th, I don't know. Miss Lucky is here with Sergeant Bob says, all right, Rob, if the officers falsified info, that is bad and should be dealt with. The trouble I have is the Fed sticking their noses in this civil rights excuse stuff. I don't disagree with you on that, Sergeant Bob, right? This, this case is sort of a little bit, you know, it's interesting because when you see the Feds, they exercise their prosecutions highly partisanly, right? In a highly partisan manner. They're very political. An interesting book is The Prince of the City by Bob Lucci. NY City drug squad corruption to an unbelievable extent. I will reserve further opinion until the facts are all in. Some officers may not have known about any falsification if in fact it exists. The officers who did not know about this should at this point not be culpable. Very complicated case. It is true. It is true, Sergeant Bob. And uh, yeah, we will see. We'll see how they're charged or what their defenses look like. 
also says, everything else notwithstanding, officers need to be absolutely truthful at all times. However, even if I were in a justified incident, I would tell the FBI agents, I'm not going to answer those questions. I want an attorney. Yes, Sergeant Bob. That's rule three of the one, two, three rule. It's I don't answer those questions. No, not without a warrant. And number three, I want a lawyer or an attorney, right? Same thing. I want an attorney. I don't answer those questions. Those questions. No, not without a warrant. Number three, I want a lawyer and stomp your feet when you're saying I want a lawyer. And you can, you can even, you can even throw a temper tantrum if you want. I want a lawyer. Uh, you can do that if you want to until they give you one or they stop asking you questions. Better than saying, I invoke my right to remain silent. Just say, I want a lawyer. Skip all of that other stuff. Portland had a drug vice division scandal around 1979. Part of the fallout was a uniformed officer being shot and killed, knocking on the door of a suspect developed based on corruption. So yes, there is no place for corruption. And some agencies do not have quality firearms training and judgment emphasis. Wonder what the LPD has. Good question. I don't know, Sergeant Bob, but I appreciate you chiming in on that one. Always good to have your, your thoughts on some of those officer-involved shootings. Thunder7 says, all I know is that anytime Benjamin Crump gets involved, he is involved in the, yeah, he does sort of, it's a bummer when he's involved, but he is involved in the Breonna Taylor case. He says, the finger pointing at all cops as racist killers begins. The demonization of the police and the innocence of any victim if they are black. Rob, you covered the case, Rob, and it was all a terrible botched raid gone bad. Nobody deliberately went there to kill that woman who actually was meeting with a known drug dealer, according to Thunder 7. But once again, the DOJ prosecuting and persecuting cops for doing their job. And I don't believe half of what the woke DOJ says anymore about anything. Valid. They have weaponized the agency against cops, against patriots, and anyone who isn't part of their lunatic left club. I think that's true. I think you can have it. You can, I think that is true. <laughs> they, they are weaponizing the DOJ. We've seen it. We've covered it here. FBI and Jill Sanborn, they said specifically, homegrown violent extremism. Same thing with the DOJ. So it's not far off. And three girlies, we give our shout out to the youngest girly in the house who was moseying on into the kitchen. Shout out to the three girlies over here. And we did a quick refresh over on lo Locals. Sean Bram on YouTube says Mike Glover has a good video on what happened to his group who had zero violence. He's looking for an attorney. Mike Glover. I'm not sure who that is. Mike, is he on YouTube? Mike Glover. I I'm going to guess he's on YouTube because you're referencing him. I don't know if it's this guy's channel. Cleared Hot Podcast. I'm not sure what that is, Sean. I'll look it up after the show, but thanks for the flag on that. What happened to his group who had zero violence? Is he maybe a J6er? I'm not sure. Here, Lava Java, thank you, Sean, for that. Lava Java Lava says, Rob, I request my wrench to be taken. YouTube chat mods appear to be off topic and unprofessional. Please review the chat and make your own decisions. Have a good one. Lava Java Lava does not want the, can I, can I, can you abdicate your wrench? Or... I think you can do that. Can Do I have to do it or can you just give it up? I don't know how that works. But Lava Java Lava, the next time I see you in the chat, I will go ahead and unmod you. Thank you for your contributions thus far. Please review the chat and make your own decisions. Have a good one. Uh, take it up. There it is. There's Lava. Okay, so Lava. I'm going to do that right now, Lava. And it is done. Thank you for your help thus far. And I will follow your recommendation and take a look at the chat. But thank you, Lava. Okay, so we had another one from, uh, those were two, were from Sean Brim. Sean says, I support Breonna Taylor too. Police corruption happens at all levels, even the state. So I believe everyone should be made to play fair. There you go, Sean. I think that's a very astute observation. And he also says, before Bivens versus six unknown agents, Fed agents were sued and prosecuted under state law for constitutional rights violations and felony invasions of privacy at the state level. Need a revival of that. Yeah, so saying, there was this sort of uh, series of cases that, that, in, in, that, that brought out uh, qualified immunity for police. You know, so you, you sort of used to say, if police did something that violated your constitutional rights at the state level, you might have a civil cause of action at the state local level. But then you have qualified immunity, which basically said that, you know, if you're a government employee, you have a, a heightened level of immunity that immunizes you from criminal and civil liability. And, you know, those 
those rules create strong incentives and perverse incentives. And sometimes, you know, you have to find out where that line is. Because look, if you make it so that cops are overly exposed, then they're not either going to become cops or they're, if they become cops, they're not going to enforce or engage in risky type of enforcement. Because if they tackle somebody who's stealing somebody's purse, they might be subject to a civil rights violation lawsuit, right? So they wouldn't engage in that. And so you'll either have no cops or sort of, you know, emasculated cops who can't do anything. And I mean that for the female officers as well, you know, where there's no real enforceability because they're all too scared to engage. So if you, if you move the incentive structure in a way that, that disincentivizes police officers, well, then you might not have officers and you can see what can happen there. But if you go, you know, the opposite and you say that they're ultra immune with qualified immunity, which is sort of like absolute immunity in many cases, then you can't prosecute and put the, ins the disincentives against bad behavior on police departments and law enforcement agencies. So it's complicated, right? You try to find that line. And I know that there are a lot of differing opinions on that, which is why I talked about this one. It's on purpose. I know that there are differing opinions and that's what makes it a little bit more fun, doesn't it? Wild Child is here, says, John M16 asked this on the other post, but did you see PBS cut off their stream as soon as Cruz mentioned Project Veritas? No, I did not. I didn't see that. That's funny, though. Sorry if you talked about this. I'm late. I didn't get the notification. YouTube! Ugh! Well, I think I posted it. Yeah, I, I did. Send, I said notify everybody here on Locals. Good to see you, Wild Child. Miss Lucky says, Miss Lucky and I love Arizona. The best move we ever made. It is a beautiful place. Also says J. Edgar Hoover, The Man, The Secrets by Gentry. We readers will not believe it, but it's all verified. Yeah. I think they made that a movie too, didn't they, Sergeant Bob? MSW20 is in the house. Savvy Sue is here. Says, Rob, welcome back. But no topic on regarding Arizona election crud. Here's the problem, MSW20. It is like a forbot verboten. What is, is that? Is that how you say that? Look at this. YouTube community guidelines. I Look, I would love to talk about uh, the election stuff. And I'm probably going to do individual sort of uh, off YouTube live streams for locals. So I've got a plan in place this weekend. I'm going to swap out all my gear because currently I'm using a software-based solution. I've got a hardware solution that's going to allow me to do some more things and level up this place a little bit. So I'm going to work on that over the weekend and swap some things out. And then um, I'll be more capable of doing locals only live streams where we can talk about some of the non allowed stuff on YouTube. But let me just show you this. Okay, so this is literally from the YouTube community guidelines. Okay, this is stuff I basically live on this page sometimes. But here, here is what you cannot talk about content advancing false claims of widespread anything glitches or anything or any content or anything about any election basically and this list is not a complete list so any past presidential election it's not a complete list so in other words if you get on here and you start ranting and raving about anything that may have happened in uh you know an election anywhere in Arizona anywhere in the United States i think youtube is going to start to give you the old boot on that and it's something that I've already got a warning and a strike for. Actually, the strike was for medical misinformation. The warning, I think, was for... It's hard to tell. I can't even keep track of it anymore. I've been in so much hot water with all of these different platforms. It's really a shame, but it is what it is. All right. And so that came over from Locals. We're going back over to Locals. That was from MSW Savvy Sue. Tweak is here. He says, keep an eye out for more election results from Maricopa, 7 p.m. Still many, many votes left to be counted according to the Maricopa County Department. And it's true. There are a lot of votes that have not been uh, tallied up yet. Let's see. Maricopa County's reporting. Why aren't 100% of the ballots counted yet? We follow the law. Signature verification, bipartisan processing, provisional ballot review, five-day post-election period for voters to cure their signatures. And they're working hard away over there. You can see him now. They're going to update their results by 7 p.m. And they are processing the ballots. And so the only one that we're really waiting for here is the Carrie Lake, I think, decision. She's up by about not a lot of votes, actually. So it's pretty close. And we'll see what happens there. But thank you for sharing that one. That came over from Tweak. We're going to do a refresh. I saw Bear Ashby says, can the FBI, CIA, FBI are corrupt. Some people 
some police who are going to call Ghostbusters. I still back the blue. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, you know, I, I try not to try not to beat up on every single police officer. There are people that do that that say every cop is bad. All cops are bad. That is not me. But I am certainly somebody who wants to call out the bad cops, the bad popo, and boot them out of there because we need more Sergeant Bobs out there. We need more former LEOs out there. And I know there are others of you who do listen and actually have been a part of our community for quite some time, right? We need the good cops. Same with lawyers. We need the good lawyers out there. I'm tired of bad defense attorneys out there who just take people's money and throw them in the garbage. No better than the prosecutors. And there are those people as well. So I think it's about... It's about calling, calling out the bad, the, the bad entities in a, in a system that, that has potential to be good, but is oftentimes deviated by the malicious actors out there. Thank you, Bear Ashby, for being here. I appreciate that support. Sean Brem says, Mike Lover, the YouTube, the Fieldcraft Survival Channel. Oh, that sounds like a great channel. I was just out in Wyoming, and so I could have used a little Fieldcraft Survival Challenge. Fieldcraft Survival Channel. Let's pull this up. Otherwise, I'll forget it. Here it is. Uh, well, is it on YouTube? Let me see here. All right. And so that came in from Sean Brem. Yeah. So I've got this one here. Fieldcraft survival channel. Oh man, this looks like a good channel. Look at those thumbnails too. Those are popping thumbnails. All right. Thank you for that. That came over from Sean Brem and our final ones over from locals. Our final refreshes here. We have Sergeant Bobby says there are some rules on qualified immunity can go away with criminal behavior and reckless behavior, etc. Yeah, I know, Sergeant Bob, that's technically true, but it's all like. It's like a criminal, like criminal behavior. It's like you have to like murder somebody with a hatchet. Like, OK, you shouldn't have done that. So you're going to go to jail for 30 days. <sighs> Give me a break. I know, I know, Sergeant Bob says, you're a good man, Rob. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Balance and honest viewpoints. It's, it's what we try to do. We try to learn some stuff and have a little bit of fun and get the feedback from the people who actually have some lived experience doing this work. And by the way, if you haven't checked out Sergeant Bob's book, you should check it out. I don't have my copy here handy. I think it's over there. I think it's over on my bookshelf. I'll have to dig it out. But Sergeant Bob brought a, bought a, wrote a book, and we talked about it when we were doing our interviews, sharing his experiences, so you know he knows what he's talking about. And that, my friends, is it for the comments that came in today. I appreciate everybody who is, uh, who is here for the day. Playing Hooky says, Rob, don't turn into Fox, Rob. Don't turn into Fox News. I, I don't intend to. I hope I'm not turning into Fox I could be like Sean Hannity here and just, you know, you're a great American all day for two hours. Hopefully I'm not uh, going that route, but certainly this is a dynamic program. There are ebbs and flows that happen here, right? I'm constantly sort of changing things and listening to your feedback. And so I do appreciate it. Let's see. All right. And so before we wrap it up for the day, we have some shout outs. We have TOS forever. We have, he says, Rob, I've texted you videos. Where are you sending them TOS forever? I don't have any text messages from you. You're sending them on email. Email Robert at rrlawaz.com or Twitter are the best places to catch me. Uh, if you want to send anything. So that's TOS forever. Phantasmagoria is here. Radice, B spec, JC, the music man. B spec is in the house and let's see others are chatting away that's over on locals on our rumble we've got we've got Virginia Mary's in the house it took me a minute we got Rick 2020 Donald John Trump Virginia Mary's here tech crisis is over on rumble fed cures in the house and I see that there's a there's a few people in the rumbles chat over on YouTube let's see we've got some final shout outs to Savvy Sue says, you're a Tucker, not Hannity. Well, Tucker, I can listen to. Sean Hannity, not so much. Matthew 44 is here. Savvy Sue, we have, holy F, my S stinks. Leon Kingsley, playing hooky, says, replace your fear. My life, my life, S term Turner. Katrina Sandoval, Curtis Bartle, K Bean says, Thank you, everyone, for your support, for the support. Thank you, K-Bean, and I appreciate that. K-Bean is modding down the place. I don't know what happened in the chat today. I have no idea. So I'm going to have to go back and take a look at that and uh, 
hopefully we're all still friends. I, you know, I try to have a nice dinner table conversation, but sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. And, you know, we're going to always try to do better and create an inviting, friendly environment where we have dinner table manners, but not all dinner parties all always turn out all that well. You know, sometimes somebody throws a plate of broccoli at the wall. It just happens. So we just have to deal with it, you know? <laughs> All right. Lean says nothing happened, Rob. It's all good. All right. So thank you, Lean, for the shout out. All right. And my friends, that is it for the show. All right. And so we're going to leave it there. We will be back tomorrow to do it all again. And I hope that you join us on that journey. As a reminder, Marvin is going to clip these up and we're going to post them as individual segments for your viewing perusal. So if you see the same topics again, you may not want to watch them if you watch the whole live show. Most people do not. Most people watch about 15, 20 minutes of the show. And so we're going to be posting all of the videos back up as individual segments. You're going to see three of them. One for Ted Cruz, one for Peter Navarro, and of course, Brianna Taylor. And I want to thank everybody who was a part of the show today over at our community, watchingthewatchers.locals.com, where we do our morning walk and chats. I had a bunch of sort of videos for, oh my goodness, Jenny B says, K. Bean was diagnosed with breast cancer, pray. Okay, so K. Bean, very sorry to hear that. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of experience with that. My mom had breast cancer. She pulled through. She had a, uh, a procedure that was worthwhile. She's still here and with us. So I know that the care and the treatment has gotten very good. If you would like to talk about that or would like to connect with my mother, she would be happy to do that. Please send me an email. You know where to find me. We'd love to support you in any way that we can. And I mean that genuinely. My mom would love to do that. I'd love to connect you too. So if that seems like it's something you might want to take advantage of, please send me an email. And if there's anybody else out there that needs help with that, my mom is a breast cancer survivor and she is a very amazing person. So she can Certainly, and I'm, I'm sure she'd be willing to talk you through this. We've had a lot of that in my family, actually. Uh, three sisters, my, my mom was one of seven. Three sisters had breast cancer. Yeah, so we've got a lot of experience with that. My mom had lung cancer, too. So we've got a lot of experience with that one, too. And she's still around and kicking. So I am really, really you know, optimistic. We'll be praying for you. But if you need anything at all, please reach out to me, okay? That is an uh, open invitation to anybody who needs help. So... All right, and thank you for alerting me to that. My goodness, Jenny B. Very important stuff. So prayers for K. Bean out there and uh, anybody else who needs that, right? You're in our thoughts and prayers. It's not a fun thing to go through. But that, my friends, is community. And we're talking about that exactly. Watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Click the join button if you're on YouTube. Shout outs for anybody who needs help in the state of Arizona with criminal charges. Our law firm is amazing. We do amazing work. 480-787-0394, free case evaluations. We have a mission, a dedication to helping good people charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and beyond that in their lives. We've got some mods in the house. Shout outs to Lean. Shout outs to K Bean, who modded down the fort for us today. Shout out to Lava Java Lava, who handed in the wrench, but we appreciate all of the hard work. Playing hooky was in the house as well. And so I'm grateful to everybody who helps to keep this show on track in the chat. We've also got our spotlight supporters. We cannot forget John at QSimple.com. If you haven't been to QSimple.com, well, I don't know what the heck you're doing. I mean, you should just go check it out right now. Chris Romero is also a spotlight supporter along with David B3 and Dr. EMB in the house, who all just send a little bit of extra love towards the show to support the work that we're doing, whether, whether they're on YouTube at the Spotlight Level member or whether they're on Locals at an equivalent amount. I really do appreciate it. It does support the work that we're doing. We've got some big plans, as I mentioned. I've got a lot of stuff cooking under the hopper to create some more content and to, to, to connect at an even deeper level because that's what it's all about, connection my friends. But that is it for us for the day. I want to thank you all for being a part of the show. Final shout outs to Tweak, to JC, the music man, to Savvy Sue, to Wild Child, to B-Spec over on Locals. Thank you to all of our members on YouTube. Jenny B, Shane Sousa, Curtis Bartle are all over there. We've got a bunch of new members. Paul Mino gave away a bunch of memberships, gifted a bunch of memberships. So for those of you who are joining us on our walk and talk, many of you 
have Paul me know to thank for that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lean. Thank you, everybody else. And shout out one final time to the youngest girly and, of course, to our good friend, K Bean. Thoughts and prayers for you, K Bean. That is it for us. We're going to leave it there. Have a tremendous evening, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye bye.